Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. For uh, speaking about uh, collecting broad coverage knowledge repositories from volunteer contributors. Uh, Tim is a research scientist at USC ISI. He graduated from MIT in 2003 and has done a lot of work on in this area, collecting knowledge from volunteers. Uh, he was involved in the Open Mind Project among and Learner, Learner 2 system, among other systems. And uh, in March of in a month or so, he's going to be uh, chairing the AAA Symposium on Knowledge Collection for Volunteer Contributors, uh, which should have a nice collection of papers, so you guys should all come, or if you don't come, at least come read the, go read the proceedings after it's done. So, um, you actually have to come. <laughs> yeah, you have to come, <laughs> otherwise you don't get to read the proceedings. So with that, we'll welcome Tim. So a lot of thanks go to uh, Matt for uh, organizing this and dealing with the scheduling troubles I tried to throw his way. Um, I want to talk about collecting, and not just knowledge, but really these broad coverage knowledge repositories. There's lots of different things you can collect from volunteers, but I'll try to emphasize um, knowledge repositories. Um, so uh, first thing I want to open with is that these things are useful, and people are still figuring out exactly how and what for. But um, there is some evidence out there uh, that they can uh, enable natural language understanding, sort of the more knowledge intensive processing tasks and um, more uh, intelligent applications, including user dialogue, uh, prompting, assisting users. So um, in the existing resources, there is Psych and WordNet are the two big sort of broad coverage things out there. WordNet is widely publicly available. And um, the bibliography illustrates uh, hundreds of uses in, um, in research. Um, and there's also wider claims about uh, uh, intelligent applications that can potentially be enabled if we have these uh, broadly uh, broad coverage knowledge repositories. Um, so maybe we can do some interesting new stuff in addition to doing better on current tasks. Uh, and if you guys ever have questions, you know, I, I would like to be interrupted so, uh, and challenged. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, these are uh, uh, WordNet and Psych um, are two examples out there. They've been constructed with uh, what we can call a highly trained small team. So people get together and uh, uh, author these. Um, uh, and what really happens, and this is acknowledged both by the creators of these resources and people who try to work and analyze with them later, is that there's a shortage of person hours brought to the construction process, um, which can impact the coverage of how much stuff is entered, uh, can impact quality to some degree. Um, so for example, for quality in WordNet, if you look at printers, um, inkjet printers and I think laser printers are two different types of stuff. And one is a sort of a computer printer, and the other is an output device. There's no cl clear reason to split those off. So um, non-consensus views and sort of uh, not, additional, not enough additional validation might be issues. Um, also, uh, George Miller, uh, uh, the, author, the originator of WordNet, um, stresses that some of the th things would have been really useful to have in WordNet, but they're not there because um, they just didn't feel they had enough uh, manpower, person, hours available to really do a good job of covering those. So they really didn't even go into those um, issues. Um, and that in includes things like basic level categories, encoding those, or encoding uh, typicality of senses, and a lot of stuff that people wish for in WordNet. Um, and finally, I already touched on this, but um, once you engineer an artifact, it doesn't mean that you're completely done. So even once it's done and somebody, somebody's point of view went in, use uh, application-specific use often calls for some re-engineering or stressing some aspects of it. So that's, that's in a nutshell, that's a highly trained small team approach to constructing resources. Um, an emerging approach that I'll be uh, talking about is to turn to um, volunteer contributors. And the idea is that at the leaves of the web, there are all these people sitting around. And uh, can't we tap them as opposed to just documents um, and have them do some interesting entries for us? So um, interestingly, the approach goes back to uh, at least uh, 1800s with the Oxford English Dictionary, which solicited um, earliest usage of words uh, mailed in to, to the uh, authors over 70 years or so, actually, this went on. So it's not, it's not a new approach, but with the advent of the web, um, collaborating in mass has gotten um, a lot easier. 
and uh, it's attracted a growing amount of research. Um, I also want to point out Wikipedia, which is not quite collecting uh, facts or computer uh, parsable knowledge, but um, it's interesting and illustrative um, because of its volume, current volume, and the number of users and the quality that, that has actually been accumulated in the articles of Wikipedia. So large, uh, uncontrolled sort of collaborative effort uh, with few um, rules or hierarchy imposed, but uh, very high um, quality and broad coverage resource comes out. Turning to some of the systems uh, that actually collect uh, common sense or everyday knowledge or broad uh, coverage knowledge repositories, um, we have the earliest system was probably the Open Mind Common Sense, Push Singh et al. at uh, MIT Media Lab. Um, and by now, they've collected 600,000 assertions. Um, there's a follow-up system, Open Mind Indoor Common Sense, which focuses on indoor knowledge uh, by other people. Um, psych, the psych team is actually coming around that way a little bit, too. They have what they call the fact entry tool. And that does some, uh, really simplifies entry into PsychL. Um, so you, you deal with it by entering knowledge into templates, which you extract from, which humans read off from text documents things like that. So it's not really driven by volunteers. It's, paid, it's driven by poorly paid uh, graduate students. So that's, that's almost like volunteers. And they have some, <laughs> they have some thoughts about uh, turn, opening it up to a broader audience. Um, uh, these are the systems that really, and I'll say a little bit more, the systems in red is what uh, I've uh, had the privilege to be involved in working on. And um, I'll just talk a little bit about, more about them later. But that's Learner, Learner 2. Um, and then uh, I think uh, you guys might have heard about the ESP game already. Uh, Louis Van Aan, Laura Dabish, a uh, very interesting approach to not quite collecting common sense knowledge um, in the sense that I mean, but uh, still tapping thousands of volunteers in, in an engaging way. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, and I balded Matt's name here. Just <laughs> as props. But um, in addition to constructing the systems, there's also some uh, work on reasoning over evidence of varying quality that you collect. Uh, from them, and how do you how do you do interesting things? And I think this is really crucial work to unlocking the potential of some of this stuff. And um, uh, David Stork, with a student of his, Chuck Lamb at Stanford, have done some interesting work on this too. And uh, Matt Richardson's work had uh, a lot to do with this. So um, there's also thoughts about initial applications. So Henry Lieber and Media Lab is thinking about these, and the Open Mind Indoor Common Sense before thinking of some robotics applications. But um, I should say that there's still a lot more to be done in thinking and exploring exactly what we can do with these resources and understanding uh, of where we should be going. Um, so this is very uh, early stuff. Um, so uh, I said, initially I said sources of opinions in this talk, but then I said views, so I don't know. Take it as you will. But um, I've, I've worked on some of these systems, and just very briefly, uh, some of the things they did. Um, so the, the PhD thesis really, try to reason from the collected knowledge and pose new knowledge acquisition questions, new hypotheses about what else might be true. So the idea was that it would sort of snowball in its quality. And when it enters into a new area, it asks very silly knowledge acquisition questions. People answer yes or no. But as it learns more and more, it uses the similarity and analogical reasoning to try to ask more pertinent questions. We were actually able to observe such, um, such phenomena from, vo from volunteers. Um, and by the way, it collected a bunch of assertions. Um, it had some shortcomings, or it was sort of an exploratory system. So we learned some lessons, and I'll be talking in more detail about those, and the, which resulted in implementation of uh, Learner 2, uh, which is more recent. And um, Yolanda Gill, in whose uh, group I work at, at um, ISI, has been involved with that um, a little bit. So um, the addition is to bring in notion of templates and invocation rules, rather than dealing in parsable natural language, which is what Learner did. And I'll touch on that. Um, the word expert system uh, collected uh, tagging of, uh, given a sentence, which word sense is this word in? And uh, multiple volunteers would say, well, I think this is word net sense number one, and this is word net sense number two. And then we tried to adjudicate and so on. So, um, and then finally, uh, there's also been a paraphrased game which we have deployed. This is a little screenshot of it, but um, what it does is people try to guess uh, paraphrases of a given expression. And there's some targets that they're trying to guess. So they get points if they guess what an obfuscated, uh, an obfuscated target. So they're trying to guess. But by, that, by doing that, they expand the number of paraphrases that we learned. 
Um, and on the other hand, I've done a little bit of work on um, the system we call VerbOcean, which extracts fine-grained semantic uh, relations from the web. So an issue that comes up a lot is actually, um, well, why do you need to collect from volunteers when you can always get it all from the web? Um, and I'll try to touch on some of those. So um, uh, this work has helped me think about um, what can you get from the web, what can't, and when is it more appropriate to turn to which. Um, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll come out in, in support of the volunteers, although the general, the general viewpoint I have is actually that synergies are possible. So um, uh, just to give you some examples of what's not explicitly or very clearly on the web, uh, things like word senses, right? Things are not annotated, so it might make sense to uh, turn to volunteers to get at least some training data. Um, then there's knowledge also, in addition to just simple knowledge, like what, what are parts of something or what is a something, there's knowledge on things like needs, desires, and actions appropriate in certain situations. So if your car broke down, what do you do? Well, you call AAA. And that's sort of more nuanced or situation or context stuff. A lot of people have uh, an easy time um, producing. You can sort of imagine how that would be valuable if you're trying to build something intelligent. But uh, it may be more difficult to extract from, from the web. Um, uh, um, and the other sort of uh, systemic strength of turning to volunteers is that, let's say you've been collecting something, and this piece of knowledge you're still not sure about. Some people are telling you this, some people are telling you that. This happens a lot with extraction on the web, too. You have sort of mixed statistics, or there's some noise in the data. So with volunteers, you can turn to more people, or you can say, well, why, let's collect some more opinions. With the web, um, you sort of well, you, you sometimes can, or you can wait for the web to grow, which it does at, at a decent clip. But um, in, a, in a sense, as you're doing your extraction, you, you can run into, well, it just isn't on the web, or there's too much noise on the web, so you don't quite know. Uh, whereas with volunteers, you can quickly get more feedback, or as much as you need. Um, with that said, uh, broadly, collection from volunteers can really um, help verify and disambiguate the web extracted knowledge. So let's collect a bunch of noisy, high recall, low precision stuff, or high precision hopefully, but then run it more through volunteer evaluation uh, and validation to, um, to get better stuff. Um, and then there's more intriguing possibilities even. So maybe volunteers can guide web extraction. So volunteers can say, well, you really need, for anything that's a tool, and you use something like Wordnet to figure out what tools are, you really want to get what their typical uses are. And then maybe you can use extraction techniques for that. Or you can try interesting things like we can try to only extract snippets or kinds of things from the web, which is not in complete knowledge, but which would serve to prompt volunteers to think of more complete answers or fuller sets of answers. So I think there's, there's really exciting synergies that are possible. And frankly, there's been little work because a lot of people work on extraction from the web and, and just that. And uh, some people work on collecting from volunteers, but the crossover just hasn't gotten enough attention yet, in my view. Um, so I'll focus on a couple of topics here. Um, there's actually more to say, but uh, in the interest of time, I think I'll try to contain myself to these two. Um, one is uh, how do we? One is sort of on the knowledge side rather than on the volunteer side. So how do we construct interfaces which give us stuff that's useful to work with? How do we collect um, design interfaces that collect useful knowledge? And I really use the word interpretable here as as one hook because you want to collect stuff that you can later process. Um, uh, because in a sense, right, in, in natural language, a lot of things are said on the web. But the difficulty is you, know, you have to understand what exactly it's saying. Um, and I'll touch on some of these issues, like whether you want to collect a lot about or a little about a lot of topics, or you want to really go in depth on a particular relation, such as a part of relation or a particular uh, topic. Um, and then there's some other issues, like engaging contributors and so on. And the second uh, part of the talk, we'll really talk about uh, more heavily about volunteers. So when we have a bunch of um, volunteer contributors, how do you manage their effort? How do you get them to uh, tell you the things that you need? Um, and what I'll look at there is a system where the contribution is fairly unguided. And um, you observe some of these effects in terms of coverage and quality, like sort of like little kids when everybody runs after the ball. So everybody tells you the same, most obvious thing. But then some other areas are underserved. So I'll show you some hard data on that that um, helps to make concrete some intuitions. And then there's actually um, a surprising finding that I'll get to also. Um, so that's the structure. And let's, let's go into the first uh, topic. Um, 
questions so far? Or we press on? Did I set off any, any nerves or any step on any feet? Uh, all right, not badly enough to, to evoke a question. Um, so um, the collecting interpretable knowledge um, lessons I'll try to share with you is really learned from experience w working with the open mind common sense knowledge, which was used as seed knowledge in Learner. So I've, and, and while I wasn't involved in collecting it, I've analyzed what it looks like and what the, some of the issues in it are. And the other one is designing and deploying the Learner for um, the PhD project, which lasted from 2001 through 2000 end of 2002 and like January of 2003, so a um, couple of years. Um, yeah, and the lessons were implemented in Learner 2, and I'll just uh, show you what it looks like. And uh, this is the very high level view of the lessons that were embodied in it. Um, and then we'll go into them in a more, bit more depth. So it's available on learner.asi.edu. It's actually been uh, deployed as a kiosk in a science museum, which is a slightly different way than to employ it, deploy it on the web. You get contributors of all ages just walking up to it and typing something in. They don't log in. You don't know unique users or anything. They, t they say something, and then they walk away. Um, but um, the idea, uh, the, the new ideas, and there's been some retrenchment in the, the fanciness of the reasoning it can do from Learner, but some of the new ideas are to use a semantically constrained, detailed, um, carefully designed template. I'll say more about that. But here, instead of allowing parsable natural language, it instantiates a template like X is typically used to do something with something like a printer. And then uh, users fill in the blank. And um, they can also say something like unreasonable question to say, you know, yeah. So this is not a game where they get points. They're just doing this out of the goodness of their heart? Or? Yeah, so this is in a kiosk. And it says, you know, on one site you do this, on another site you do this. But, but you said you collected like a million, hundreds of thousands or millions of facts. These are not guys trying to get the highest points or uh, this is This is not a competitive thing, yeah. In the paraphrase game, you do get points. But here, um, I think part of the motivation is to see how clever it can be, because it tries to use the knowledge that you give it to say, oh, I now know this based on what you told me. But well, you do get and feedback, if I answer that. You do get a bit of feedback, yeah. And I'll get into that. So there's a mechanism uh, I call invocation rules. So it can relate what it just learned to what is, is already in the knowledge base. And it can try to generalize from that and pose a generalization question or something. Or it can say printers are similar to copiers because they do this and this. That's presumably interesting to listen to. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with the 13 or 14 year old in a science museum kiosk with a bunch of his buddies around you who puts in a printer is typically used to, I can't say it in public, something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there is a percentage of that. So we do have uh, taboo lists for things. Yeah, but um, even beyond taboo lists, uh, just brand typing random words. Yeah, yeah. So then, then we'll get to some data on redundant entries. So you, beyond taboo words, you look for things to be given to you several times um, or validated. And validation is something the system doesn't do. But if you've heard something several times, it's a lot more likely to be reliable. And I'll get to some data on that. Um, there's also the other approach, rather than to police them, is, is to incent responsible contributions. And I won't be saying much about that, but that's what the paraphrase game really tried to explore. Yeah. It seems like there's kind of an interesting trade-off between like, if, you, uh, if you're incenting them to give you good responses, but then maybe you're not able to get as many. Versus, you know, if they're just typing anything that they want to do and just having fun, then maybe you can get more of a worse quality. So you can get yeah, then you're back to extracting from the web. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Right, right. So, I mean, do you think it's better to have, have these games, uh, not games, but have these things set up so that you're really trying to get them to give you good information or just trying to make it as fun as possible to get as much information as possible? Um. Or, you know, so, so, so the original learner went for breadth, and that meant once it's learned a fact, it wouldn't try to learn it again. And the idea was that the validation could be an entire later stage, or there could be techniques that take a bunch of dirty knowledge and try to identify good knowledge in it through inference. There's actually a piece of work on that, or some court coming up. But um, I feel that collecting some cleanliness is good, or emphasizing it to some degree, and, and then working only with that knowledge. High level. Okay. Good. Um, the other thing, in, in it's sort of related to this theme, is interpretability of the input. So whenever, so the original Open Mind site um, would use templates like X is for blank, and then people would say studying is for getting a good job. And something like getting a good job is a pretty elaborate beast if you start thinking about it in a fine-grained way, right? Or you know, um, going to a museum is for having fun or learning new things. And 
And even three words to us are sort of very intuitive unless you work on natural language enough and then you sort of realize how painful even that can be. So here there's a real emphasis on very piecemeal acquisition. So user responses here are encouraged to be, you know, you can't, you can't mess around too much. You can't say a uh, piece of report called a paper tray on Tuesday or you can't really qualify them you know, too much. And that's by design. Um, so let's talk about interpretability in a little more detail. Um, templates try to constrain the semantic relation. I already mentioned that. And if you don't design your templates carefully, you'll collect um, stuff that's not semantically pinned down at all, right? So something like X has Y gives you all the same stuff as dogs have puppies or car has an engine or researchers have publications. So very different having. I guess having babies is not on here, but that's yet another meaning. So you want to uh, pin things down, in my view, and then start, while, while the part of relation is still actually tricky once you zoom in on it, there's different forms of it. Um, you can be a part of a group, or you can be a physical part of it. So, um, just constraining it to that way is already a big progress as opposed to um, the kinds of patterns that you're likely to see in, in free text or that people are likely to generate when they're just giving you stuff. So um, compound entries are broken down. I mentioned that. And then um, uh, templates also and I'm, I'm pitching this as a strength, but it can be viewed as a weakness, right? So all of a sudden, if you're using templates, you can't say things like trees grow in the ground uh, if there is not a template for that. Uh, but you do focus on a given relation, which I think actually has some usefulness in uh, making the system, giving the system enough density or coverage quickly to do some simple reasoning over it and to, do, to give feedback. So if you want things like generalization from the knowledge, if you have a lot of part of knowledge, you can start generalizing from it. Uh, but it's, I, I agree with you. It, it seems like you're creating WordNet with volunteers in this case, though, because you are severely restricting what the volunteer can contribute. So in designing this activity, we actually picked, we focused on two uh, relations. One wasn't in WordNet, and that's typical use of a tool. So, so mean, guns are used to shoot. But here, yeah, this, this relation was actually meant to be something that is in WordNet to some degree. The, but the I mean, the same limitation that holds for WordNet, namely that it has only a limited set of relations that it knows about and you know Miller acknowledged it would have been nice to have more but you can't do it so well so here yeah yeah. yeah so here the part of the claim is that you can march through the relations you know it took it took word 15 years to get to, to 2.0 but the, the point is that you're bringing a lot of volume and then you can switch over to another relation but um, such a thing as a, assuming that there is such a thing as fixed set of relations Exactly. And, and, and there's always learner, which lets you enter anything. So if you want that, you can use that knowledge. But some of the frustration has been that once you release like a learner knowledge set, I had a feeling that a lot of people don't know what to do with it. Right? And that's, that's why some of the retrenchment actually to a fixed kind of relation. To, uh, because here you can, you can say, well, this is how you reason with it. And people have a lot easier time wrapping their minds around this. So. Excuse me. You may have said this, but yeah. Uh, in the previous slide, when you construct questions, how do you, there's a box for in a reasonable box, but how uh -huh. do you make sure that most of the questions you're asking are actually not reasonable? Like, you know, printer is typically uh -huh. used to something. But what if it's a tree, you know, is typically used to... So one thing we did is we, we seeded this with, with tools, with a subset of tools from WordNet. So you and, already have to know that... Well, then the way the activity is set up is it actually can grow its set of things. So it says, oh, what else has this part? And then it might learn about a new object. And then it starts asking the question about this new object, which you've never heard of before. What parts does that have? So that's a one way to, to grow the collection. But this unreasonable question comes up because people say, the system might say, well, what's a part of a paper clip or a bar of soap? And a lot of people would say it doesn't have parts. Um, so, um, and then the system uses that knowledge not to ask that again. And then you can imagine fancier schemes of, of, using, of leveraging that knowledge. But, so. <coughs> All right. Uh, so a little bit more about templates and invocation rules. That's really what uh, Learner 2 introduced. And um, uh, I want to point out that there is also a trend towards templates, not only Learner to Learner 2, but um, the psych team in the rapid knowledge formation uh, research or project that they were involved in had this tool for parsing natural language and then saying, well, is this a correct cycle expression that you meant? Um, 
which proved to be very complicated or proved, you know, you, you, ha you get very elaborate psychal expressions, hard to understand them and so on. And uh, later they've, they've moved uh, to the fact extraction tool, which uh, in a form uses templates and actually keeps the problem more simple. Um, whether, you know, whether you're happy about it or not, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, and then, um, yeah, so, so templates, especially when they're narrowed down to com con collect only a very fixed kind of fact, um, become useful again if you combine them with what I've been calling invocation rules, which means that once you learn something that, like a copier is typically used to duplicate something, you can grow the statement. You can say, well, what things does it, uh, is it used to duplicate? So you can refine and build on the knowledge that you've collected. Um, uh, and then you collect things like duplicate a document, docu duplicate paper, duplicate whatever you want. Um, so um, invocation rules allow you, A, building on your collection, and B, um, as I mentioned, tying to the other knowledge in the knowledge base, uh, comparing to it, saying, well, this is really weird compared, given what I already know, or might this be also true? So, um, and uh, I mentioned a lot of this already. So invocation rules help uh, bring the picture back together, I feel, um, after introducing the templates. Um, actually, yeah. the, going back to the duplicated document, Case, yeah. The Given copier and duplicate, wouldn't one be able, for example, on the open web to get a much larger list of things that a copier might duplicate um, um, without direct user input? I'm just trying to figure sure, out the pro sure. you know, um, what the limitations are. So here, so this activity admittedly is collecting a lot of stuff that, that might be on the web. And actually a lot of interesting approaches might have to do with maybe collecting some seeds and then using them to expand um, what's available on the web. Because web expansion of, of seed sets like Google Labs sets kind of stuff can really do a lot of good for you to, to get um, big recall. So uh, I'm not averse to those. And, um, the point is that with enough words, with enough keywords, things start to become narrow or too narrow to have reliable web counts, even with the recent step up to 8 billion documents on, on Google, index documents on Google. So um, once you have three or four qualifying things, it's really hard to get enough of stuff um, in, in, in my experience. Um, but yeah, the web is great. And what you can get from the web, you should get from the web, probably, rather than volunteers. The other point on, on comparing to the web is actually that um, uh, volunteers, if, if you view the problem as of a limited size, so once you've learned something that shoes have souls, you never have to learn it again. And if, it's, if it has an end, then maybe it's okay to bring a million volunteers to bear on the problem to give you the, that, knowledge with, that knowledge with enough quality. If it's bounded and if it's manageable by the volunteers, it's not that you have to go to the web. Um, uh, this is, uh, I'll go over this quickly, but this is just the thought again of, um, do we go after everything and then have potentially spotty cover coverage of the most salient facts? Or do we really focus, do we really march through some of the relations that we identify and that we want to talk about? Um, and I feel that through, by marching through uh, uh, relations, we can deliver some of the collections sooner. So we can say, well, here's a bunch of part of knowledge. And we can quantify what we are delivering at, a certain, at any given point. Um, so that's sort of a tactical advantage, maybe, um, or a tactical point, at least. Um, and then you can, you can use it in reasoning more, as I mentioned. Um, this is just an example of how the system generalizes. So, uh, it would learn that boats have hulls and ships have hulls, but then it would say, are boats similar to ships? And then people can say yes, no, depends on word senses. They can give you this multiple choice kind of input. And this is functionality actually built into Learner too. So that's how it tries to engage you a little bit more. Uh, and then uh, doing things like generalization can actually do some interesting stuff, like allow you to learn the exact scope for things which have hulls. Or you can try to delineate that where, where the exceptions lie and so on. Um, so extracting negative knowledge is the other thing you can do from volunteers. People tell you that no, penguins don't fly. And dealing with negation um, can be tricky. Um, so this is just some stats of uh, the result of deploying the system for six months. And this is actually a traveling um, exhibit at the Science Museum. It started in Minnesota. It's coming around. Uh, I don't think it's coming to Seattle, unfortunately. But uh, um, it's going to go on for another three and a half years. 
Um, so far, uh, most of the knowledge or knowledge lies, it's as part of Mironomy knowledge and typical use um, knowledge. And uh, there's 24,000 assertions that have been collected after some post-processing, which is removing taboo words and some senseless input, which has been done fully automatically. So, um, all right. So uh, this is some examples of the kind of stuff uh, entered. So here's the parts of the telephone that we learned. Uh, Telephone cord, earpiece, and some of these actually have multiple accounts. I'm not showing them everywhere, but um, uh, you have some redundancy knowledge to help you. Um, there's typical uses of a telephone. Um, a very uh, sort of preliminary evaluation, this is with a single judge, um, had 76% of the, the assertions pegged as good, and then the, of the three bins, and then 18% as questionable. Um, questionable had to do with senses or just Question, notion of what makes a part, can a hole be a part of a basketball? Um, in some weird sense it is, but um, you have to um, be more precise about what you mean. Um, and um, you can look at overlap with WordNet, and actually things get a little bit uh, interesting there, because WordNet has things like Oyster is a part of a pen. And if you look into what's going on, an Oyster is a kind of muscle that a bird has, and a pen is a female swan. And both of these are news to me. But these are sort of non-primary senses being uh, present through inheritance in very clever ways. So um, contributors provide sort of the salient and the clear knowledge. And they usually mean the default senses of the objects and so on. So different kind of knowledge, actually. And looking at overlap with WordNet is a bit of a tricky task. Um, but there's some preliminary data. Um, so why why, why yeah. is the head on question? Oh, I guess just because of the head being not, yeah, not the default sense of head. So it's not because it's, because it's not the default sense. So an engine, for example, has a head. Right. So, so yeah. So that means the judge was as, was sort of confused as a layer and had to of scratch their which head. is called a head. Yeah. Um, so sense ambiguity is a, is a pervasive sort of issue, right? And volunteers can potentially help, but the the management of senses has to actually be pretty explicitly present in the system. And it's a tricky problem. Um, and that comes up in web extraction a lot, too. Yeah. So Fleischmann, Hovey, and they had a very nice system for extracting part of relations. Have you looked at how it compares with what they have? I looked mostly at uh, Roxanne Girju's system, and then Berlin and Charniak work for the part of for the web extraction. Um, and there, I mean, the complaints are the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, those are the ones where I actually looked at the data and compared the stuff. So my Fleischmann stuff, um, I can I can do more comparisons with. Um, but um, sorry, yeah, taking yeah, on yeah. to part of. So it was interesting with the telephone part. Some of them uh -huh. you have to have it in order to function as a telephone. Some of them are not an optional pieces like port. You don't need to have one. Uh -huh. Probably, right. cell or some phones don't have cords. Right. right. So I wonder if there's ever any cases of applications where you really need to distinguish those two essential parts, you know, almost definitive parts. You can probably invent one on the spot, right? Or you can kind of imagine why that's useful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, so just kind of, you know, why exactly what kind of relations um, you want to collect might be dependent on how you. Yep. And I'll actually, I'll actually come to that. So, so the view that uh, we've come to very, fairly recently is that um, there's a variety of applications for which you're trying to target. And there you can think of a whole publishing or filtering process which, which takes in use requirements and says, well, this is the knowledge you should be looking at. This is just sort of a framework to think about this, right? But um, as you collect your knowledge, you should be qualifying it in a bunch of ways so that you can do some of this interesting filtering. So for some applications, you can imagine, give me anything potentially related. So processing text and spar spotting possible anaphora or something like that would make you want all the conceivable parts with some noise allowed. Things like prompting users or dealing with users in, where you need a small set of the most salient parts uh, would have a very different user requirement. So, um, um, so the view has been, uh, collect this knowledge to some quality, and then you can refine it again, and you can do that with volunteers. Um, but actually, scope quantifiers might be extractable from the web, and that's something I've done a little bit of thinking. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, does the occurrence of dial reflect the fact that it's showing up in a science museum? 
Uh, I don't know the answer to that exact question. But, uh, anymore. but I think <laughs> or something. It's but I think I think it is interesting. So people do come up with pretty with answers that I wouldn't have been able to generate. So there is some sort of anecdotal feeling of the breadth of the sort of stuff that people think of actually, even though this is you know a lot of 14-year-olds and their buddies. So, I mean, the Science Museum is not exactly a museum museum. It mm -hmm. talks about robots and us. That's the exhibit uh, title and says how our lives are going to change once robots rule the world. Something to so, that. Dial seems even more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm still. How many, how many of these tuples, whatever you call it, did you use those on the order of 100,000 you've gotten? Yeah, in half a year, in just that kiosk without web. Oh, so, I just. I think you can pay a, I don't like it volunteer versus. Is it, it would cost, let's say, is, you can pay someone 10 bucks an hour probably. So uh -huh. let's say it's 10 cents per one of these things. So if quality matters, you could get, you know, for $10,000 or so, you could have bought what those volunteers gave them. So it's, it's better not to pay 10000 than to pay 10000 But it doesn't seem like it's an enabling technology because, if, you know, if I own by definition, if it is important, one could afford $10,000 to get that question and pay for that. So I know, like, in the, the game that we listed, the, the ESP game, the thing yeah. about that was, because it was a game, he was actually talking about the a billion annotations in a week because people would want to play them. So that seems to be an enabler because we could never afford a billion. But these numbers, it seems like it's, it's nice that you're saving money that you could get on a trip somewhere or something. But it doesn't seem like it's really, I mean, you're not getting data that you couldn't have, couldn't have gotten otherwise, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, if you feel that you can buy your way through all the data that you need, uh, that's that's this good. Even in the realm of NSF grant, this isn't even, this isn't Microsoft money. That would be you know, NSF grant money to, to <laughs> pay people for that. So, um, well, I'm not I'm not averse to to paying people either. But the, I think the idea is that to get the quality and to get sort of spontaneous kinds of things that you want to try and to get some breadth, um, I, I think you just can't you. I think it does take a lot of money, I guess, at some point. So it's not that these things are boring people to tears, right? So it's not, it's not like a shooter game, but at the same time, a lot of people provide this sort of feedback that says, oh, I felt like I made the AI smarter, or I felt like this really made a difference. So we do get thousands of contributions from a person. And um, when the task is hard, you know, I've, I've done some of these just pure evaluations. Um, it's very hard to. You know, pay somebody enough to, to do this, or to recruit them, or to get in, you know, to to rerun the experiment, or replicate the data, and so on. So, so I think I think the underlying claim is that people actually want to do this, or you're sort of tapping into some desire to construct an AI collaboratively. Right. Also, so yeah, so about increasing interpre interpretability. Um, the summary is that uh, templates with invocation rules help. Uh, piecemeal acquisition is something that I've uh, defended. And then um, the reasoning enabled um, how, um, may help engage contributors to, to give you more, to stay up at night and, and keep giving you this kind of knowledge. Um, so from here, I want to shift uh, gears a little bit and talk about uh, managing the contributor effort. So when everybody is giving you this knowledge, how do you um, collect a lot of it? Um, and. Um, the current systems out there, they really collect spontaneous contributions, as I mentioned. So it has this sort of ru everybody running after the ball um, phenomenon. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what Learner 2 uh, collected in terms of the coverage and the acceptability of the knowledge. Um, and then there will be a framework for managing volunteer contributions in, in the more complete sense. And I've mentioned parts of that. Um, so uh, we study the part of statements collected by Learner 2. And out of those 27,000 or so, 24,000 part of statements, we focus on the ones about the seed objects, because that's where the coverage is um, the most focused. So what does it look like? Well, um, the top five statements collected um, all these, uh, had all these redundancy counts. That means 136 people told us that handle is part of a hammer. And in terms of percentages, it's really the 0.2% of the distinct statements learned uh, took up 8% of the collected entries. And that's sort of overweight. And the claim is that the effort should have been spent on something else, which may be a little bit harder to enter, but uh, is still valid and useful knowledge. So radiator is part of a car, or a crankshaft is part of a car, uh, which were never entered in, in our um, collection of this size. Yes. So I, I'm still focused on 
head of beer, but um, do you <laughs> reject the head of a hammer in this case as questionable? Um, because it's not. It's, a, it's up to volunteers, and, and the, the real answer is to see if, if the judges disagree about this, then you want to qualify that in some way. And there, the right way to qualify it would be in that head of beer sense or in that top of sense. It's, it's acceptable. So I'll get to the knowledge being, the sizable chunk of knowledge being sort of neither clearly acceptable nor clearly bad. We'll talk about that a bit more. And what about, can you? Yeah. Um, Push volunteers to enter knowledge in their own area of expertise or interest. Does that help? Like crankshaft, I, I wouldn't have come up with crankshaft if you asked me to list parts of a car, but a mechanic would probably start listing, you know, CV joint and all these kinds of things, which <laughs> could be very useful. But so that that gets. Some, uh, sorry, I was going to say, don't some of those come through as in a sort of hierarchy? An engine is part of a car. A crankshaft is part of an engine. Some of them do, yeah, and, and there's an issue of when you want to collect, like car has probably 10,000 parts or so around the order, right? right? So you might want to have some segmented collection techniques. Right. What so an aerolon is part of the wing. Or you can even try things like what's in front of the car, what, what parts can you think of, just to prompt contributors and focus them a little bit more. Can you go the other way also? Yeah. Like crankshaft is a part of something. Uh, typically, when you start with a car, people fall into some main parts fender and handle. But if you go the other way, people know the, about them. It's just that when you start from a more generic one, it will be harder to cover the radiators. Good. Yeah. So, so I think you guys are sort of starting to tell me how to increase coverage over here, how how to do it, and and uh, there are some points about that. And Learner 2.5 has these features implemented, actually, but not Learner. Well, I guess this touches on Lucy's interest, but I mean, these all seem pretty obvious. And if you just looked at a web search engine and explicitly looked for that string, yep. a handle is part of or a handle is part of a hammer. Yep. I think you probably would find quite a lot of hits for all of these, wouldn't you? And you'd get a ranking out of that as well. I mean, again, back to this question of. Need to so these are well. These are examples of the most uh, uh, highly frequently sure. told. So the problem here is that people are blurting out the salient stuff, right? Which, but, but if you which maybe you could even extract, or at least if you heard it five times, maybe you could stop getting it, right? Right. But if you look so. for the ones that were never entered on the web, would, don't you think you would find those? Radiator is part of a car. That string. That must be present on the web in some form. I would think yeah. so. So the problem, was, well, the one problem with extraction on the web, right? And I don't want to berate it. I'm sure there's interesting results to be had from that, but. One problem is that you do get everything you want, or a lot of what you want, plus a lot of stuff you don't want, right? So mechanics are part of a car, or you know, his his but body was part of the car. You have hit counts to guide you there. Uh, yeah, you do until until you start really extracting, and until you start, I mean, right? There's redundancy problems. There's count. It is noisy in, in the current sort of best state of the art. And that's one point. But the other one is, yeah, so maybe with part of eventually, right, with good enough methods and clarification of what we currently do, a lot of the action will be on the website, maybe with volunteers validating or clarifying things. But some of the tasks that uh, I've argued for um, really feel to me like they need volunteers. So specifying word senses, qualifying. Some cars have this part. So cars have airbags, right? You would have that as a part, and you would extract it from the web. But it might be useful and interesting to know that some of them don't. Power windows, stuff like that. So, so I think all I'm all I'm trying to say, I'm not saying throw out web extraction out the door. And, you know, um, uh, I'm saying this is an emerging approach, and there's a lot of people doing web extraction. And there's not as many doing this. And I don't know about paying people. I mean, I guess maybe you can win the lottery and sort of just buy everything you need. But, yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess Wikipedia was constructed also from you know, volunteer contributors rather than bought editors. So, um, uh, and that actually, sorry, but that brings me back to a, to a certain point that um, the claim that the knowledge will be made available and will be used by scientists and everybody for research and building AI actually does seem to have an impact on whether people contribute or whether people think it's worthwhile. So if it says, you know, give it to my project. People are a little more weary to work as hard for you. Um, so open, open something is good. Um, so a bit more about coverage. So this is the curve uh, on how many assertions total we have and how many distinct entries we have. So if you look at this in terms of 1 over n, um, you get diminishing returns. And the point is, once you've heard 
certain answers five times. The more answers you've heard, the less likely is the next one to be useful or interesting to you. So you have these diminishing returns, which actually argues to me more about we should be pointing volunteers to more uh, where the action is or where, where what's unexplored um, to make the best use of their effort um, and not run into this problem of needing more and more with uh, less and less help. Um, so that, that was a little bit on, on coverage, and I'll have some methods for increasing coverage. But um, I really want to say that um, this is a point that's not sort of as common in, in natural language papers that I see, um, uh, really. So there are people, people often, this is a straw man, but people often try to define a task on which contributors agree, and then you have your interannotator agreement, and then you're done. But I think part of what, what's going on here has to do with the deep, annoying issues with knowledge representation. So some of the knowledge is clearly good. All right, everybody agrees on it. And you saw things like uh, hammer has a handle. But um, some are clearly bad. And you know, this is people just entering this kind of stuff. And it has to be thrown out. Chicken part of knife. I don't know what, what they're thinking. Um, but um, yeah, and you want to incentivize responsible contribution, which is that paraphrase work, which I won't talk about. But um, many other people, or many other assertions, are in need of qualification. And um, one example here is, is film part of a camera? Well, no, not for a digital camera, right? No, not for a camera that you buy. But yet, it's not in this crazy statements category. It certainly feels OK to some degree. So let me tell you a little bit more about qualification, or the kinds of problems that, um, that come up. So sense ambiguity, we already talked about. Head part of beer, or row, row is part of a table. Some judges actually rejected that. They said row is not part of a table. And presumably because they were thinking that this thing doesn't have a row, but a, a data table does. Um, scope quantification, we mentioned that. So airbags or remote control is part of a radio. And that's the stuff you, you can get from the web. But the scope quantification sort of comes afterwards, or you have to build on that. So some radios have remote control, some don't. And then um, the underspecified semantics, right? So a page is part of a book, but an idea is also sort of kind of part of a textbook in a different sense than a chapter or page is. So intangible part of, or you know, do parts have to be tangible? Is seem a part of a baseball? Another example that comes up. Kind of a part, but you know, not, not in the same way that something very clear is. Um, a page is part of a book. So, um, and the point is that volunteers can uh, be used, again, to qualify these statements. And maybe some web approaches can be used to qualify these statements. Um, um, so it's sort of interesting, actually. So the, the comments that you guys have been making is, why can't I get this off the web? Right? But in a sense, the approach is sitting between getting stuff off the web and uh, authoring knowledge with, with experts. So nobody sort of really worries about, why don't we do this with experts? And I think the human volunteers, by having common sense or having some of it, some, most of, some of the time, um, can actually play the role of these adjudicating experts. And that's, that's some of the value or the, the marriage of knowledge creation by experts. And in fact, we, don't, we haven't done any such work. And the, the, the raw nerve you hit is that you include psych so often in this presentation. <laughs> we, but we'll can discuss that afterwards. Well, I, I speak badly of them. They're so. <laughs> 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 well, included. Well, that's all right, <laughs> So I think there's, yeah. sorry, I have a, one yeah. more question. Please. So on the subject of like, could, could you just pay people to give you this knowledge? There's kind of an interesting question. If you pay people to give you the knowledge, do you think it'll be better quality, necessarily? Like, can, can you pay Oh, if you don't pay them for giving bad knowledge, that might help. But <laughs> I mean, if you pay them you know, minimum wage or nearly minimum wage to give you this information, um, and they're just going to rush through it, then you know, maybe you won't get as good of knowledge anyway. I, mean, well, I don't know. It's well, the other, the other point is that if you, if you need a million facts, right? Let's say we're paying people. Great. We still need the questions of identifying the, the reliable contribution. So all of the issues that are coming up here are not really about getting it for free, right? They, they have to do with how do you structure the acquisition? How do you get something that you can use? Yes. And that's what I've been talking about. So in a sense, right, money, money, money doesn't hurt. And, and, and whether you pay them per hour or you pay the highest contributor, you do prizes, which is what Open Mind has been doing. You know, they try to give away some T-shirts. Actually, that's uh, that might be a better way to incentivize people too. So nothing wrong with incentives. Incentives, whether they be um, action, excitement-based or, or financial gains from from doing this. But um, 
I think the, the research issues are still there. I, I'm more worried about the fact that the, the hard things, the things that might actually be difficult to, I'm uh, still stuck on that part of the head of beer, yep, yep. but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's too early in the morning, I know, but <laughs> uh, that the things that you seem to be able to extract reliably also seem to be the things that I would expect to be able to extract reliably by using statistical techniques on the web. Whereas the harder things like capturing the fact that the head of the head is part of a beer when it is in the glass is, uh, is something that I would probably have more difficulty. I would get the, the association through mutual information perhaps um, on the web, but I wouldn't know anything about that relationship necessarily, and that would, to me, is the so I think the I think hard, the, yeah the information that we would really like to be able to get at um, the row part of table one is another one because I think you're, it, it's being discard it's being discarded because of a limitation on the knowledge. If somebody has had that knowledge. Well, it's being, it's being flagged as needing further attention. And, and it's being now needed as, yeah. right. But then you're going to have hundreds of thousands of items that need further attention that somehow. Yep. And that's, that's where volunteers turn to. So uh, admittedly, this is learner two. This is not learner five, right? And, and I think part of the lesson is to tackle things which are more clearly not sort of not as web extractable. And to me, extracting part of from the web is not a solved issue. And you know, we can disagree and hmm. talk about the issues. But um, qualifying knowledge, you're saying this works in this situation. They're extracting negated knowledge. Penguins don't fly kind of stuff. Just it's, it's hard to do from the web, right? And, and you should think of this. Um, you can imagine doing it, and you can imagine doing a lot I, of I research. Can imagine, I can imagine taking something like Wikipedia and and uh, a few other sources and discovering that penguins don't fly. And there's some really cool uh, work going on about this, right, even here. And, um, you know, I, that should be done. So I think all I want you guys to take away is that this is an interesting approach. It's headed in, in the direction or it can offer some advantages of having somebody think about it. I mean, holy gosh, right? Um, and actually, historically, that's how I came to um, doing work on this, too. I was doing web extraction. I was frustrated. The web was a little smaller when I was starting. But I was surprised to tell you that you could never really pin the thing down. So you would be uncertain about it. And this, to me, really felt like you could turn, at least for some questions, to these oracles, right? These people who, with enough redundancy, are not kidding you. Um, so um, it's, this, it's this getting more opinions and getting more data from humans on tricky questions that I think distinguishes it from uh, what has been given to you on the web without thinking of how do you explain it to a computer, right, for the sake of communicating with other people. Um, so so I, need to, I need to speed up, uh, so I'll skip over some things. Um, I did call for questions, you know, and uh, uh, <laughs> I called it upon myself. So uh, very briefly, can we try to identify which statements are of higher quality? So if we look at the redundancy, how many times something has been said, Things which have been given to us only once um, by a majority of judges are acceptable only 60% of the time. But if you climb to things like have been said five or more times, you climb to a 97.5%. So this is a graph. Um, there's a bit of good data about that. And this is for the part of relation. So that suggests that stuff like this, you might not want to validate very, very extensively, or that might be good enough. But uh, things like this are really sort of at uh, web or sub-web performance even. And, um, this is, this is better than the published numbers that I've seen. But again, comparisons have to be done carefully. There's differences in uh, coverage and so on. Um, the other thing you can think of is, given a car, right? How many, how many times do people say engine? How many times do people say crankshaft? And there will be these things that I'm calling generation frequencies. So engine is just spontaneously generated a lot. And the, what, what I would sort of expect is that if, you, if something is frequent, spontaneously, frequently spontaneously generated, it's more likely to be right. Um, not so if you, collect, if you correct for redundancy. And we can argue about this if we have time afterwards. But um, if the redundancy is two things which are generated less than one-tenth of the time, so answers are generated less than 10% of the total answers about car, they're actually more reliable than um, the things with higher generation frequency. And, and the trend continues. 
uh, all across for high redundancy stuff. Here, it's not there, presumably, because there's just all these noisy statements in the data, the rare ones. But um, this is an interesting finding that I wanted to show, uh, throw out there. So there's some unintuitive stuff going on that's meriting further thinking. And everybody seems to have a theory about this after they think a little bit. But I haven't found one that I'm completely happy with yet. Um, let me show you the model or sort of the framework of how we've come to think of uh, these collection systems or how they should work and how that compares with web extraction and so on. So the current ones are really sort of um, just in this area. That's where the action is. There's an entry interface. There's some contributors. And they give you a raw collection or some collection of the note. There's not much of this feedback of saying this is the coverage assessment or this is what, um, uh, this is what I already know. Why don't you tell me something different? That feedback loop hasn't been there uh, historically. We're saying that needs to come into the picture more. We're also saying that evaluation and revision has to be an important stage. So evaluation is where you say, what do volunteers or other automatic, maybe automatic means, what do they think of this knowledge? Is this acceptable? And then it's uh, being sent one of three ways, discard, release, or qualified. Uh, qualified knowledge needs to be refined, so head of beer being assigned a sense, and then sent back to the evaluation. Finally, you get a reviewed and elaborated collection. You get this publication process, which I sort of mentioned. Um, and that's determining which knowledge to release for use specific application. Because knowledge has additional information about it, about how much people agree with it, and, and, and so on. So that's a model. Um, these are some ideas on feedback with collection. I mentioned I already know these things, or point contributors to this way, or I'll prompt them with some web stuff. But uh, I'll fly over this. And almost on time. Um, evaluation and revision um, is this step, and that's really the step that the web doesn't really offer, right? So once we got some knowledge by uh, whatever trick we liked from volunteers or from the web, let's look at the uh, knowledge and let's have volunteers comment on it. It's still not well explored, so more work on this needs to happen. Um, do volunteers agree? What we found in our judges is that some judges accepted 75% of the part of, another judge accepted 58 or so percent of the knowledge. So they just had very different calibration levels. So you need to think about that. Can you um, evaluate the evaluators? So can you plant some items and then see if they're screwing up on those, some gold standard items, um, just to uh, weed out the people who are screwing around with you and so on. So there's, a, there's much work to be done there. Um, key points I'll, I'll skip over, actually, because I already hit them. Um, and uh, this is some of the systems, just highlights of what they did um, that I've been thinking about uh, for a while. I welcome questions about those when I meet with uh, many of you, um, or now afterwards. And um, this is a model that uh, helps us think about um, the future direction. And um, this is sort of an allusion to a Vonnegut quote from Timequake. But, uh, I think there's, uh, there's really a bright future, and there's a lot of work to do. Um, we still haven't completely even proven that this is a must-have kind of method. But um, there's these directions like refining um, the approach, exploring web extraction as massive source for qualification by volunteers. For some tasks, maybe that's the right mix. For some things, you really maybe have to go to volunteers because it's hard to get anything like that from the web. Um, um, then we've got to think about what. Uh, um, yeah, we got to, so the idea of uh, tight integration with reasoning is also very appealing to me. So the stuff that we collect, can we try to see whether it's useful? Can we see whether it's good or bad? Not just by having people vote on it, but try to use it in some even simple reasoning application and then see if it breaks. And then people need to qualify it on a very need-based way rather than some formal criteria. I think that to me can both make it exciting and really kind of close the loop on using the knowledge. Um, I've been thinking about how to build such a system for a while, and it's, uh, I haven't, I'm not finished thinking, I guess. Um, so explore daring uh, new applications. So uh, there's got to be stuff that we can do that's, um, that's neat. And uh, Henry Lieberman and people have, have some claims or potential directions. Uh, things like web search might be enhanceable, organizing information. We can talk about other ones. Um, these are some URLs for the things. Uh, there's papers about these topics on my homepage over there. And with this, I will close. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Have I fought all the battles already? Yeah. <laughs> well, so in terms of uh, exploring the tight integration, in one of the Open Mind papers, they talked about showing the users what new inferences were made possible using the information that they just entered. And 
And um, I haven't seen it exposed. I haven't seen it, but I saw it described. And, and which, that, which, which open letter? Basically, you enter a new piece of knowledge, and it would run all of the inferences that were then. But is this open mind common sense? Or? Open mind common sense. Very right. sure. Yeah. Um, and I thought that that was an interesting. I mean, I like I say, I haven't seen it exposed, but it seemed like that that would be a very uh, interesting way to incent people to provide reasonable. Um, well, maybe not. I mean, yeah, no, no, maybe well, so that, yeah. <laughs> but I think I think I think an even larger point is what nice. is when people are doing this debugging kind of activity, and that's not something that's not even knowledge extraction. That's sort of providing knowledge for the sake of making reasoning go through. Right. And the emphasis is shift on reasoning and debugging reasoning, and that's <coughs> it's kind of a whole different ball game from web extraction. Right? So, um, so. I, you know, I have some notions about how to close that loop and how to try some of these things. And invocation rules are a step in that direction. But um, yeah, I, I was saying that as an example where I do think that volunteers are crucial because yeah. they can provide, and that goes back to what Matt also was talking about in the paper as well, in your paper, where people can see which of their no pieces of knowledge contributed and and you know kind of get rewards for for that again, kind of coming back to the game. Honor. Well, be, yeah, being able to stake the most useful piece of knowledge, right? I've contributed this, and everybody, everything is rested on it. It's, it's very exciting too, if you can enable that. But yeah, so a task or a mechanism that uses this stuff would really um, cinch the deal in a lot of ways. It's still, it's still out there. I think it's a prize to be claimed. Basically. All right, there's a promise of lunch, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So we're going to go get lunch if anyone wants to join us for lunch, and then.